Good evening. Still navigating mask and microphone. How you doing? Good to be with you this evening. Welcome to church. Welcome to God's family gathered together today. We're glad that you're here. A few updates for you in the life of our... First of all, it snowed today. What? That's what I heard. I was inside all day and I heard big flakes snowing somewhere. Did, who saw that? Raise your hand if you saw snow. Anybody? I only see what... I'm, I think... Okay. I don't know if I believe it. I'm just saying. I don't know if it's true quite yet, but... That's what Pastor Tom told me. Pastor Tom, it, it happened. Yeah, okay. All right. It happened. So uh, we have tomorrow a time of celebrating, gathering together, Fall Fest. We are going to be outside. We are preparing safely and carefully meals inside, individually prepared, individually packed. And uh, there'll be uh, fun activities for families, for anybody that would, so if you're here tonight, but if you would like to come back tomorrow at 11, 11, 15, we would, uh, we're going to be heading right outside and doing that tomorrow. Just a way to spend time together. We really miss spending time together as a community, and this is one way to do that. Uh, It's going to be a lot of fun. This evening, we are sharing communion together. We do that on the first weekends of the month, so if you haven't received your communion elements, please uh, get them. They're individually wrapped, and we will be remembering Christ in that way this evening. Um, Kids have been participating in our worship service by identifying little clues on the platform uh, that connect with a moment and a a line or an image from the sermon. And so there's a couple couple of items on the platform again tonight. Uh, Also, kids have been drawing what they hear in the sermon, and so in the pre-service slides, you may have seen some of the drawings that the kids made from last week's sermon, and we love that. So we are providing those opportunities for kids uh, during the messages. During communion weeks, we take a benevolence offering. The way we are doing offering in this time is to have uh, a box in the foyer and boxes at these exits. There are envelopes there that if you would like to, in addition to uh, giving with your tithes and your offerings, if you would like to, uh, to note a gift to the benevolence ministry, uh, you would do that by putting it in that envelope and then putting it in the offering box. Registration cards are in your bulletin. Please fill those out and put those in the boxes as well. We would like to know that you're here. And then lastly, I want to invite up David Ceballos. David is our new youth pastor. This is day three for him on the job. Welcome him with me, would you? So give you just a second to say hello and... All right. Yeah, so like Go Josh said, my name is David. Um, this is my wife, Rebecca. Uh, yeah, we're, we're super excited to be here. Um, and just at St. Germain E. Free, we are humbled to serve just alongside of all of you. Um, we do have one big announcement for the youth group, and that is that we are going to be starting up youth group again in person on October 14th, Wednesday, October 14th, 6.30 to 7.45. So I know what you guys are thinking. How are we going to navigate these COVID waters, right? So we're actually going to be in step with what the schools are doing, a little bit of social distancing, required masks, cleanup, and all that, so you don't have to worry about it. But yeah, we're just excited, and we're, we're ready to get this ball rolling. And I also just want to take a time to thank all of those people who have been invested in prayer and serving in the youth ministry, even before me and my wife got here, just throughout this whole season, you guys have really stepped up. And honestly, I'm blessed to just be where I'm at, and you guys helped me kind of transition smoothly. So I thank you guys so much. I know the families and the leadership are all thankful for that as well. So um, let's continue through the the service. I'm going to pray for us. Um, So please bow your heads. Father God, we just thank you so much um, just for the privilege of worshiping here together, Lord, and um, we just bring this service before you, Lord, as an offering, and we just, um, yeah, we just humble ourselves before you, Lord, and recognize that you are God of the universe, and you love us so dearly, Lord, and we love you too, and just let us um, just pour out our hearts in worship today together. Um, Let the sermon touch our hearts, Lord, and challenge us as well. And um, as we move forward tonight, in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand? Let's sing.
have to do with our fear and reorienting our fear onto the goodness of our Lord. So this next song continues to do that for us and leads us right up to the cross where all of God's goodness was shown to us and fulfilled to us and our fears literally just vanish at the cross. This song celebrates that. It's been a joy to work with Zach. Thanks, Pastor Zach, for leading us in worship and to welcome David in this week and to have these uh, godly men and godly women that I get to be on staff with is just a wonderful thing. So uh, it's a new season. There's a new kind of journey and path ahead. It's exciting. 
We are coming now to a time of remembering Christ in communion. Uh, just today, we celebrated and honored the life of Debbie Reed. One week ago today, Debbie went home to be with the Lord. And Debbie was a fixture in this community uh, for good reason for many years. And in this church community, she sat right there most of the time in the second row, um, raised her hands and sang. Um, just, I told a story in, a, in the service today of how she would, she would invite people all the time to church. Just really encourage them to come with her, bring her grandkids with her. And uh, she just really was a, a sweet sister uh, in Christ. Just a wonderful person. And it brought to mind the time that Jesus went to see uh, the, the grieving group of people that were surrounding kind of a memorial service, kind of a funeral, um, just remembering his good friend Lazarus. And he came to the tomb where Lazarus was, and it's the shortest um, verse in the Bible when it says in John eleven thirty five 35, that Jesus wept. And I've always been struck with that because he knew what he was about to do. He knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. And yet he entered into the grief and the loss. And there's hints in the text that he was even angry at death. He entered into the sorrow and he entered into um, being upset with those people. In the face of death, our Lord cares for us. That's our Savior. And he loved us so much that that affected him, that he was filled with grief in response to death. So he went to the cross, and he died for us so that he could then conquer death and provide us with new life. All of that is wrapped up in communion. If you are joining us online this week, uh, we ask that you acquire your own communion elements and join us at this time. If you're here, then I would ask you to take out the communion elements that you, that you were given when you entered, and there's a little thin piece of plastic over the wafer, and you can begin to get that prepared. For now, uh, let's humble our hearts, and I want to pray together uh, with you. At the end of this prayer, I'll, I'll be praying the Lord's Prayer, and you're welcome to join in with me uh, at that point. Loving Savior, Jesus, our Lord, you promised to be present where two or more are gathered in your name. And so it is really a miracle of God that we remember you, and yet you're here. Help us to be in awe of that. Thank you for joining with us in the sorrow of death but thank you for defeating death's sting on the cross. Thank you for loving us and for suffering on our behalf. Right now we want to humble and humble our hearts and just, Lord, be genuine in our repentance before you. We pray together now the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Sitting with his followers on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And then he gave it to his followers. And as he gave it to them, he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You can take and eat.
in the same way. After supper, he took the cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you. Take and drink. Heavenly Father, these are different and strange times. And we, we just want to still press through and push through and remember your son. We want to appreciate your love for us through the gift of your son to us. We want to thank you that you've given us an opportunity to gather. And I pray that you would continue to keep us safe as we gather. We hear stories of people being ill and of all that's happening in our world and so, Lord, we, we just do not take this time for granted. We know we need this, and we're grateful for you. As we open your word now and focus on what matters most in our lives, I pray that you would guide us, keep us attentive to your presence, and grateful for your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you've got a Bible, please find Luke chapter 6. We're going to be in what is called the Sermon on the Plain today. In my better moments, on my best days, when uh, I am strong in character, I like a challenge. I like to do hard things. Uh, I, I appreciate tasks that have uh, clear and solid conclusions to them, sort of black and white, activities where there's no faking it. Uh, you can either play guitar or you can't. You can either uh, shoot a shotgun and hit a clay pigeon or you can't. You can either uh, cut a board to length and make sure it's straight and make a shelf well and hang it up on the wall, or you can't. And with all of those pursuits, there's a measure of risk. Uh, with music and guitar and singing, you, you risk sounding bad and making a fool of yourself. Uh, with firearms, there's deadly danger involved. And with woodworking, there's a table saw, and there's a chop saw, and there's power tools, and all of those things take a measure of care. But I like those endeavors, not because I, I want to invite harm or I just want to kind of risk things and just see what happens, but I like those endeavors because I believe our Creator made us to work hard, to engage, and to overcome challenge. And those things have been challenging to me in the past, and I find a great deal of fulfillment in kind of tackling those tasks and coming out the other side and, and seeing the outcome. I believe God made us to overcome challenge. I believe that is true in life and work. I believe it's true in sport and in pastime. But I believe it's also true in faith. That we were made for action. We were made to face challenges and to overcome them through faith in Christ. Jesus modeled that for us. And he teaches that to us in this passage with a number of stark examples and clear exhortations to his disciples and to the other followers that were present. Uh, the teaching that lies before us on the open page uh, of Scripture today um, is Jesus' teaching. If you've got a Bible with uh, red letters in it, it it's all Jesus' words. And we're going to be in Luke 6, uh, verses 27 to 49, the title of the message is Living on Purpose. And it's one long extended time of teaching from Jesus to his followers. It's known as the Sermon on the Plain. There's a lot of 
uh, parallels to the Sermon on the Mount and the Sermon on the Plain. Last week, I was gone at a wedding, and so Rob and Rachel worked through Luke 6, verses 12 to 26, where Jesus picked his starting team, his, his 12 disciples, and then taught them to see difficulty as blessing and comfort as caution. So it's not surprising that we find the rest of Jesus' teaching kind of carries a similar tone and theme. And so here's the theme. I'm going to give it to you right at the top so you can think about this with me. I, I believe this theme may be the, kind of the theme that, that sums up all of what we're about uh, to look at today. And this, the, here's the theme. The best measure of whether or not you have welcomed the love of Jesus personally is if you see it in your own actions and hear it in your own words. The best measure of whether or not you have welcomed the love of Jesus personally is if you see that love spilling out in your own actions and in your own words. One of the most pressing questions of, in a life of faith, if we're seeking God, is, have I been saved? Do I know the Lord? Um, as a pastor, I've heard that, uh, that question and that concern at the very end of life. On, on, on more than one deathbed. But if we're sensitive earlier in our lives, we can ask that question sooner and we can pursue the answer to that and then live out a life of faith in Christ. How do I know I'm saved? How do I know that the love of Jesus is truly within me? It's a question that has to do with our hearts. And the best way to answer the question about what is on the inside is to honestly look at what is on the outside. Personally, Jesus isn't giving us this as a grid to judge everybody else's outside. <laughs> it really is, a, is a, a personal exercise for ourselves. Jesus was teaching to compel us to live well, to accept the challenge, to do the difficult thing. To actually want to do the hard thing because it's fulfilling when we see it come through in the end. It's actually a miracle of God. Loving like Jesus loved is just one of those realities that cannot be faked. We either love the unlovable or we don't. We either bear good fruit or we don't. We either have a solid foundation or we don't. And so what Jesus is teaching here is simply the best measure of whether that is true on the inside is to look at what is happening in our lives consistently on the outside. Because frankly, loving like Jesus loved is impossible to fake. It, it's a miracle to live. Jesus taught all of this at once, and so we are going to study all of it at once today. I want to take it in three parts, uh, all of verses 27 to 49. We'll look at it in three parts, and when I, I want to ask you three questions, one question for each part as we move through Jesus' teaching. Um, before I do that, though, would you just, just, let's just pray one more time. Heavenly Father, thank you for calling us here and for allowing us to just be here together, and I pray that as we think about uh, your character and your word and Jesus' teaching, that uh, it, it really would touch uh, something in us. It would, it would move us to obedience. It would, it would, this time in your, in your word for us would be a thing that prompts us to reply and respond. Uh, please allow that to happen through the grace of your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. So the first passage I'm going to read is Luke 6, 27 to 36. Follow along. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you, to one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also, and from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you, and from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. 
And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. Okay, here's what I hear Jesus saying in this passage. Here's what I hear Jesus saying in this passage. An enduring kind of love is not easy, but who wants easy? Listen, if you want to be followers of mine and go where I go, then love the unlovable. The ones that are really challenging, the ones that even attempt to do you harm, love them and treat them the way you'd like to be treated. Err on the side of mercy because you know what? You need that too. You're all broken rebels to one degree or another. So again, even the ones that outright oppose you Love them and be merciful. That's hard. That's what I hear Jesus saying. I think it raises questions for us. I think if we're in a small group of of followers of Christ that have opened up this scripture, I think there's a lot of questions we begin to ask as we process through this. But Jesus is super clear about this. Now, again, the scene is a crowd gathered. Uh, The picture is his disciples are like the closest to him. They're in the front row. In verse 20, which is the beginning of the sermon, uh, kind of the, the sermon on the plain, and we talked about it, it was talked about last week. In verse 20, it really indicates that Jesus was looking to his disciples as he taught then the rest of verse 20 through verse 26. He's basically speaking those blessings and those woes and, uh, and that teaching to his disciples, to the 12 disciples that he had just chosen. But in verse 27, there's a shift. But I say to you who hear. It's as if Jesus is shifting from just looking at the disciples to speaking to everybody that is gathered around, the whole crowd listening to Jesus at that time. So in a special way, we really can feel like this teaching is for all of us who seek Jesus, all of us who want to be followers of Jesus, definitely all of us here in this room today. This teaching applies to us. And the first word that Jesus says, after he says, listen, 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 you who hear me, all of you who hear me, the very first word he says is love. And the Greek word behind that word love is agape. It's agape love. Not storge love, which is a natural affection that's kind of easy. Not eros, which is romantic. Not uh, phileo, which is, uh, which is brotherly love. But agape love, which means a love even for the unworthy. A love which is not earned by the beloved. But a love that is a choice of a loving person. It's the way God loves us. It is not the way we tend to love other people. So it will be a miracle if it happens. When we really agape love others, it's a miracle. It's God working in us and through us. It's near impossible on our own. Definitely impossible to sustain for any length of time on our own. So here's the first question, because because this question summarizes a lot of of this whole section of verses. Here's the first question. Who is your enemy? Just, Just think about that. Who is your enemy? Who would you consider to be your enemy? How do we love them? How do we love them, our enemy? 
Well, the, the scripture tells us that we do good in the face of hate, that we bless in the face of curses, and that we pray in the face of abuse, which is interesting to me because we're not called necessarily to do the same things in all of those cases. Uh, we're not called to do good to our abusers. We're called to pray for them. Um, some forms of abuse are just too dangerous to endure, and we need to protect and preserve our lives by praying from a safe distance. I think it's interesting to see the different ways that we're called to respond to our enemies. But we're, 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 we're called to respond by continuing to pray, to pray, even for our abusers. Our words, spoken and written, and our actions, seen and unseen, should reflect a growing agape love. I don't think it's a perfect thing in our lives. I don't think it's this unending string of perfection in our lives. But it's a growing, um, a growing awareness of loving the unlovable with the agape love of God. Who is your enemy? Is there a name? Is there kind of a group of a kind of people? Are they close? Are they far off? We are called by Jesus to love them. Only this kind of love can reveal the power of grace inside of us. It's just so clear that it doesn't come from us. Most people are able to love the people who love them, right? Most of us are able to love people who love us. But who is able to love the people who hate them? Only someone whose life has been truly touched by the grace of God. Jesus just put this so clearly, right, right in our faces in this teaching, because this is the way God loved us in Christ. This is the gospel. This is communion. So when we love our enemies, we show that we're God's children. The family resemblance is unmistakable. Uh, Wendy and I were with some friends, some good friends of ours just a, a week or two ago, and I pulled out my phone and I was showing my friend a video from one of my brothers, from my youngest brother. And the moment that my friend heard my brother's voice, he's like, that sounds like you. That sounds just like you. The family resemblance is unmistakable, Josh. I could close my eyes and you could tell me that that, you know, just play something from, I would know that's Josh's brother. It just sounds exactly, it sounds exactly like you. When we love our enemies, it shows that we're God's children. The family resemblance is unmistakable. Now, there's a lot more there. We're just going to move through this passage. I kind of want to take it all in in one sitting. But loving our enemies is the theme. The golden rule, do to others as you would have them do to you. Listen to the next portion of teaching, Luke 6, 37 to 42. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. He also told them a parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? The disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye but do not notice the log that is in your own eye. How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take out the speck that is in your, own, in your eye when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite. 
First take out the log, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. There's a number of great illustrations here used to express the way that we are to love from uh, the speck and the log to the blind leading the blind. But Jesus begins this portion of teaching in verse 37 and in verse 38 with two boundary commands and two invitational commands. You could say that, that two are negative and two are positive. Two provide a limit, two provide this opportunity. The boundaries, don't judge, don't condemn. The invitations, forgive and give. That's verses 37 um, and 38. Judge not and you will not be judged. Condemn not and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. The way Jesus taught this is so helpful. It sort of pulls us back from our broken human tendencies. It calls us forward and upward to live lives of character. A judging in a condemning way is never okay. Now, it's interesting because in other places of Scripture, we're actually called to judge. We're called to use a measure of good judgment and discernment and to think wisely. But we are never to step into the role of God and be judge, jury, and executioner in other people's lives. Uh, There's a sports mantra that goes, uh, play your position. We need to know our role. Our call is to cultivate a giving and a forgiving spirit. And it's not math. It doesn't just, um, it, it doesn't work like an ATM machine. But when we live lives that are forgiving and giving, the principle is we receive so much forgiveness and generosity back. That's the picture. And if not in this life, in the life to come, if not physically, then spiritually from the Lord, that's the promise that we have from the Lord. We are to cultivate a giving and forgiving spirit in our lives. So here's the second question. Who is the person you need to forgive? These are maybe prickly questions, you know? I mean, who is your enemy? And who is the person that you need to forgive? What is the offense that needs to be forgiven? The Lord's Prayer that we prayed earlier says, Lord, forgive forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. As, As someone who did not grow up praying that on a daily basis and even a weekly basis in the tradition of the church that I was in, and have now in my life begun to pray that more regularly, that prayer daily, more often. Um, that, that line of the prayer always, always sticks out to me, always. I can't rush past that. Lord, please forgive me of my sins as I am willing to forgive other people. And so I just I would ask you, we prayed that prayer together, who is the person you need to forgive? And maybe it's a number of people, but trying to make it personal. What is the offense that needs to be forgiven? We will learn to take out the log in our own eye before we rush in to remove a speck in someone else's when we recognize how much we have been forgiven in our lives. In my role as pastor, I have presided over many conflicts in marriage, in friendship, in our community, and just different, different scenarios. And often one party says something like this. Now, I know I said something wrong, but you should hear what they did. I hear that all the time. Now, I, I did this. I'll, I'll own up to this. But listen to what they did. Um, and so I just want to like wave my hands for a second, and I'm doing this as much for myself as, to, as for anybody else. If you ever, if we ever begin a conversation like that or begin thinking like that, it ought to stop us in our tracks, bring us to our knees, and ask for the Lord's forgiveness. We cannot rush past our own role, our own part in, in the conflict. We can't rush past it. And if we genuinely are asking for the Lord's forgiveness, Lord, please forgive me for what I have done. 
then we bring to that next, that next part of the sentence, we bring a measure of awareness and grace and mercy of God. Who is the person you need to forgive? What's the offense that needs to be forgiven? When we cultivate this character trait in our lives through faith and through prayer, we become generous in spirit. The image that Jesus uses uh, that I love is uh, in verse 38 is a, a lap full of blessing. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be will be put into your lap. With the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. I was curious about what this was describing. Um, and the image is of uh, a marketplace and a person in that time frame in ancient times going to the marketplace to purchase, say, corn. And the seller is using their own robe as a measure. And so here's the way one scholar described what was happening. The seller crouches on the ground with the measure between his legs. And so the robe is kind of stretches between the knees and the torso. First of all, he fills the measure three quarters full and gives it a good shake, a rotary motion, and it makes the grains settle down. Then he fills the measure to the top and gives it another shake. Next, he presses the corn together strongly with both hands Finally, he heaps it into a cone, tapping it carefully to press the grains together. From time to time, he bores a hole in the cone and pours more grains into it until there is literally no more room for a single grain. In this way, the purchaser is guaranteed an absolutely full measure. It cannot hold more. That's the picture that is combined with the way we forgive and we give and we show mercy. It's only a miracle of Christ because it has to be combined with, with wisdom and discernment. But it comes out of who we are just on a regular basis as followers of Christ. People overflowing with grace and love. And so I, I would just ask you, what kind of people do you want to be? What kind of character do we want to have in our lives? People overflowing with grace and love or people who can only harbor hurt and anger. With Jesus, we can learn to forgive and to give in miraculous ways that show his love is alive in our lives. And I, on my best days, when in, in my strongest moments of character, um, I can say I truly want that. And even on my worst days, I know that this is what God is calling me to. Friends, he's calling us to this, to be forgiving and giving in the way we live. I want that. All right, moving through this. this is, there's so much here. You could, we just spend so much time looking at all the different details of this, but we're just going to continue to move through. Luke 6, 43 to 49. I mean, imagine Jesus. He taught this on the plane all at once. He just taught this all at once, you know? We're at least slowing down and considering some of it and taking our time. Luke 6, 43 to 49. For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. And the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood rose... The stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. The closing of Jesus' teaching of the Sermon on the Plain 
leans on images from horticulture to connect to the realities of the heart and on images from building to connect to the realities of the soul. So here's the final question. What kind of life are you building? Who is your enemy? Who do you need to forgive? And what kind of life are you building? Whether we know it or not, we're all building a life. And that takes some important internal work if we want it to last. The most important part of that building is the foundation. When we moved into the house that we have lived in now for 10 years, we were grateful, we were excited, it was nice, uh, we're blessed, but there were plenty of little things that needed fixing. There were, there were, there were a lot of uh, little things that we knew we needed to work on over some time. Things that after a while we began to wonder why they were done the way they were done in the first place. Ever moved in a house and kind of wondered, why did they even do it this way? Uh, flimsy finish work, unreliable mechanical elements, um, shoddy fixtures, you know, different things like that. But when we were in the house for the first really big storm, we realized that the foundation and the internal structure of the house was solid. It was raging outside. We could barely feel it inside. House we lived in Rockford would have been swaying back and forth, and then we, there were, curtains would have been blowing through the cracks in the windows. I mean, like this house, solid. You barely even knew anything was happening outside. Thankfully, we had a solid foundation. All the other stuff, we can work on that. But the foundation matters more than all of that put together. And so it is in our lives. The internal foundational work matters more than anything. And as we do some of that internal work, we need to watch what it is that comes out of our mouths. We need to watch what it is that comes out of our mouths. The end of verse 40, 45, for out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Jesus' teaching was a caution for us to be aware of our choice of speech because our words spoken out loud reveal the internal health of our soul. If you want to know what kind of life you are building, listen to your language. Listen to the words you utter or consider when you are all alone. How about when you are fed up or impatient or hurt? Some at the time of Jesus' teaching were following him and they were calling him Lord. Verse 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you to do? Some were calling him Lord. They were following him. They were physically with him, but they were not doing what he said, not speaking the way he spoke, not living the way he lived. In the end, here's the call of Christ. It's to walk the talk. If we say we're a follower of Christ, then we need to live out what we say we believe. And so, friends, anchor your life on the solid rock of Jesus. Dig deep by obeying his word. Build a life strong enough to withstand every trial and tribulation and unexpected storm. A life anchored to the bedrock of obedience in Christ will keep on standing. That's my hope for everyone here. It's my hope for all of us. Because there comes a time in everyone's life who cares to seek God when we wonder about the state of our soul. Is Christ really with me? Is he alive inside? Do I have hope for eternity? And here's the bottom line of Jesus' teaching. The best measure of whether or not you have welcomed the love of Jesus personally is if you see it in your own actions and hear it in your own words. Apple trees don't bear a different kind of fruit. They bear apples. What's our fruit? The best way to answer that question about the inside is to honestly look 
at the outside. Personally, not judging the lives of others, Jesus gave this to help us evaluate ourselves. Loving like Jesus loved. It's one of, one of those realities that cannot be faked. We either love the unlovable or we don't. We either bear good fruit or we don't. We either have a solid foundation or we don't. What Jesus is teaching here is simply this. The best measure of whether or not you have welcomed the love of Jesus personally is if you see it in your own actions and hear it in your own words. Because frankly, loving like Jesus is impossible to fake It takes a miracle to live. And so what do we do if if we're, frankly, convicted about this? Troubled, maybe, even, as we think uh, about our lives. That's a good place to be. We just get on our knees before the Lord, and we say, Lord, I need you. Guide my life. Take over my life. You are the king and the ruler of my life. And so friends, in closing, listen, I'm too tired of death and sickness and disunity in our world to mince words with you. Trust Jesus. And change the way you speak and the way you write and the way you act to line up with the character of Christ. Join me in embracing the kind of love that's hard to live, a forgiving, generous, merciful kind of love. And let's watch the way it impacts our families and our kids and our friends and our community. Heavenly Father, that will be a miracle if it happens, but you've offered it to us. You are love inside of us spilling out into the lives of others. And so I pray that we would believe that and we would live that and we would live with the contentment and the fulfillment and the joy of seeing that, your love spilling out into others' lives. Lord, help us to have sensitive hearts that are willing to kind of evaluate our actions and our words. Humble us as we see what we actually, what, what actually is there and bring us to that place of, of coming to you for forgiveness and then living out a forgiving life, a giving life. Heavenly Father, thank you for the teaching of your Son. Thank you for the sustained challenge that he gives us, even as he shows us his great love for us. Help us to understand that agape love, all of it, Lord. Just allow us the realization through your presence and your grace and your mercy. We pray this humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, let's stand.
perspective of your grace and your mercy. And Lord, help us appreciate it and receive it. Live out the joy. Let the love spill over into our lives and our words and our actions so that we express that goodness and grace and mercy and forgiveness with others in our lives. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, can I encourage you this week? Uh, for me as a pastor each week, I've spent time in the word, thinking about the passage of scripture at the beginning of the week. Uh, I read this uh, the day of the, uh, read this carefully, the day of the debates, you know? And, and I mean, that, that happened. So there's no, no comment on that. But just like, I, I was reading these words as I was working through the week, and maybe you were too. Maybe you were already reading this ahead of time. But I would encourage you to read the scripture ahead of time. It touches so many areas of our lives and makes us see the world so differently when we prepare to be together by reading this ahead of time. Whether you're doing other devotional stuff or not, maybe put this in there because it's so good. It helps us just see the world a little bit differently and I think more biblically and godly kind of way. So receive this benediction from the end of 1 Corinthians. Uh, the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Amen. God bless you this week.